everyone, and welcome to the Data for Good session on driving social and environmental impact with data analytics. My name is Elise Roche, and I lead our initiatives around data for social and environmental impact here at Google Cloud. Thanks, Elise. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I'm Alonso Ortiz, the Community Engagement Manager for the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. The Global Partnership is a network committed to ensure we have the necessary data to achieve the SDGs. And uh, what we're really looking forward to discussing here today are the opportunities to apply data analytics and machine learning to a variety of issues and, and to solving some of the world's greatest challenges. Um, in addition to that, also speaking to some of the use cases that we're currently seeing with nonprofits who are using our solutions and also an initiative that we collaborated on together um, around data visualization. So with that, before digging a little bit deeper into what Google Cloud is doing in this space and what the Global Partnership team is doing in this space, wanted to look at data for good as a concept, as a movement, and uh, discuss how it has evolved over time. So data for good is an international movement where private companies are working with governmental agencies, NGOs, and nonprofits to apply big data solutions to some of the world's greatest challenges. And uh, dating back to example four into uh, 2008, uh, the CDC collaborated with Google to launch Google Flu Trends with this idea that you could actually look at search trends around uh, flu symptoms or similar searches to actually help kind of predict outbreaks in that area. In 2011, the United Nations Global Pulse organization advocated for this idea of data philanthropy where organizations that have access to data can help make it available um, for public benefit. In 2013, the United Nations also utilized satellite imagery to provide targeted disaster relief, looking at pre-disaster and post-disaster areas in order to determine uh, which areas, communities, et cetera, needed the most support um, as soon as possible. Later in 2017, the UN hosted the world's first World Data Forum, um, the second of which actually took place uh, in, in 2018, uh, bringing together a variety of different industries to discuss again how we can all better work together across the private and public sectors in order to apply data analytics to these uh, challenging issues. And here we are in 2018 uh, looking at interdisciplinary programs and collaboration. And with that, there's the question, so what exactly is Google Cloud doing in this space? So Google Cloud, here we are working to empower nonprofits with integrated solutions from geospatial analysis tools to productivity tools to even a nonprofit grant program. In 2007, Google Maps helped nonprofits access satellite imagery and APIs with Google Earth Outreach. In 2011, G Suite for Nonprofits launched uh, with the idea of enabling nonprofits to collaborate and innovate together. It's also worth noting that those two offerings are uh, currently available through the Google for Nonprofits website and platform. In 2016, we launched GCP public data sets uh, with this idea of democratizing access to planetary scale data sets that are freely hosted in the cloud. Um, so whether you're a nonprofit organization or not, really any GCP user can access these public data sets and analyze them up to one terabyte per month at no charge. And these include data sets from organizations like the EPA, the US Department of Health and Human Services, the World Bank, the United Nations Statistics Division, the list continues. And in 2018, we actually announced the Data Solutions for Change program, which is a nonprofit grant program uh, with the goal of empowering nonprofits to achieve their missions at scale with data analytics. Essentially, we understand that with big data solutions, nonprofits can scale their data. They can analyze data at the scale of the entire web with BigQuery. They can automate their work and tap into artificial intelligence with cloud machine learning. And they can also share their vision and turn their data in, into customizable reports with tools like Google Data Studio. And that's essentially what underscores the Data Solutions for Change program, where we're looking to address two key challenges that nonprofits often face when trying to access data analytics um, and data analytics solutions, one being financial and the other technical. So with the Data Solutions for Change program, what we're offering uh, includes Google Cloud Credits, a need-based Google Cloud Credit grant, depending on their proposal, self-training resources through Quick Labs, and also hands-on support through Google Cloud customer support for the duration of their six-month grant period. And while this program uh, just launched in 2018, we're already seeing a variety of nonprofits applying these solutions in really interesting ways. 
One of them is the Open Agriculture Foundation, where they're using BigQuery and IoT Core in order to create healthier, more engaging, and more inventive food with technology. They've actually developed these proprietary food computers where they're looking to essentially uh, develop plant codes, plant recipe codes, and looking at different variables so that they can understand, for example, how a basil plant responds to a certain humidity level versus uh, lettuce. Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator is a nonprofit organization based in South Africa. Uh, they're using BigQuery and machine learning to connect more unemployed youth in South Africa with jobs. Um, they understand that the public transportation system in South Africa can be particularly challenging, and so with entry-level applicants, they're looking at uh, developing a proprietary machine learning algorithm um, and a job matching algorithm so that they're not only matching these entry-level applicants with new positions, but also working towards job retention. It's also worth noting that they recently received uh, a Skoll Social Entrepreneurship Award this year. The Foundation for Precision Medicine is using BigQuery and machine learning to detect Alzheimer's disease early with the goal of stopping the progression of the disease. So with Alzheimer's in particular, there's currently not a cure today. And so a lot of research is focused around finding that cure. But what the Foundation for Precision Medicine is doing is they're actually taking a bit of a different approach. They have this idea of essentially getting ahead of a diagnosis, a traditional diagnosis, by months or even years, so as to prescribe preventative treatment. Power Poetry, a bit of a shift towards the arts. Um, what they're doing is they're using machine learning to increase teen literacy through interactive recommendation engines. So they've created their own proprietary machine learning algorithms to match uh, teen submissions, teen poetry submissions with uh, rap artists and American poets. Broodminder is also another organization working with our technology, and what they're doing is they're using Firebase and Cloud Firestore to manage their IoT beehive tracking sensors and to improve bee health around the U.S. So for those unfamiliar with kind of the state of the bee population today, um, it is declining. Their health is declining. They're facing hive collapse around the United States. And this is concerning not only to the bee populations and biodiversity more broadly, but also given the impact um, that that may have upon our food systems, given the importance of pollinators, um, especially around fruits and vegetables. And one more example to share with you all um, is around biodiversity. So the Zoological Society of London is using AutoML to optimize camera trap surveys and to advance research studies with that ultimate goal of preserving biodiversity. Camera trap surveys are an extremely popular method of research in this space, and they use motion sensors. Oftentimes, these sensors um, can have you know, false positives, so that what you, what you end up with after these surveys um, are thousands upon thousands of images that need to be manually analyzed. As you can imagine, that's extremely time consuming, so you end up having folks with PhDs in biology going through each of these camera trap images individually over a period of months. And what they're working towards is reducing that time of analysis from months to just days. And I'd like to share a video that uh, tells a little bit more about ZSL and their journey. The main challenges facing wildlife today is habitat loss, climate change, and threats from the illegal wildlife trade. ZSL's mission is to create a world where wildlife thrives. We work in over 50 countries around the world where we empower and inform people to help stop wild animals going extinct. We have been working with Google to look at how we can use cloud AutoML to really make a difference. We use camera traps to monitor the state of the planet. They are tiny little digital cameras hooked up to a little motion sensor basically. So when an animal walks past, they snap a little photo which you can then retrieve at a later time. So as well as telling you about how abundant different species are, they can also offer behavioural insights as well. One camera trap study generates hundreds of thousands of images. So over six months, you might get half a million images that you need to sort through and analyse. You've got to go through every single image. You've got to label them, the time, the date, what it contains, which camera it was. At the moment, it takes months. If we can speed up the analysis from six months to just days, that's revolutionary in our conservation efforts. Google Cloud AutoML allows conservationists who are non-coders to use machine learning to create image recognition models to identify species in camera trap images. These are images that I have labelled and they're going to teach the AutoML algorithm what different species look like. 
if you can just auto ML it, you could go, show me the images that are empty, show me the images that have the animal that I'm interested in. You can actually use your scientific research and conservation time to do conservation rather than doing data analysis. We might use the data to actually influence policy change or conservation action. AI is going to play a really big part in collecting all the data together from wildlife conservation sites around the world. And if we do that in real time, we can use AutoML to really monitor the pulse of wildlife across the planet. So before I talk about the work we do at the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, I want to talk about the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. What you're seeing in this slide is the result of years of negotiations between 193 countries. They were agreed in 2015 and they are to be met in 2030. They are a framework or a guide to take action towards reducing poverty, protecting the planet, and ensuring prosperous societies. <clears throat> and I want to highlight four key things about the SDGs. First, the fact that 193 countries agreed to something, especially such an inspirational framework, successful in and of itself, especially because they have been a widely a able to capture attention from citizens, civil society, and companies. So the second aspect that I want to highlight is their universality. They're not only to be uh, implemented by governments, but also by other stakeholders. And thankfully, many have uh, committed to achieving them and are adapting and adopting them, whether uh, from civil society or from the private sector, and they're contributing to them. And I also want to highlight that they're not only to be implemented in developing countries, but also in development. Uh, the third thing I want to highlight is the, even though we're seeing individual goals, they're all connected to each other. In order to achieve long-lasting change, we need to tackle all of them at the same time. For example, SDG 2, Ending Hunger, is connected to SDG 16 and SDG 15. Uh, so when thinking about ending hunger, we need to think of land rights and, and protecting the environment. So they are connected to each other. And finally, the architects of the SDGs, besides uh, giving us the goals, they also left us with 169 targets and 233 indicators to accompany the agenda. And the targets can be thought of the ob objectives and the policies that need to be put in place. And the indicators are the way we measure progress along the way and ultimately if we achieve impact. So however, there's a big uh, missing piece in this puzzle and that's data. Data is the lifeblood of sustainable development. And in this case, the responsibility falls mainly in governments who are mandated to officially report on the SDGs. And as we know, governments have a hard time to produce timely or real-time data. In many cases, governments are taking decisions with all data, or in some cases, in the case of countries afflicted by a conflict, um, there's no data at all. So that's where the work of the global partnership comes in. So we're a global network committed to ensure we have the necessary data to achieve and monitor the SDGs. We're founded in 2015 alongside the Sustainable Development Goals, and we bring together government, civil society, UN agencies, multilaterals, and the private sector to collectively solve the problems and gaps around the production and use of data. We don't collect or provide the data ourselves, we'd rather provide a strategic partnership, advocacy, technical assistance, and pilot tests for our partners at the national, regional, and global level. We also provide offline and online spaces for partners to come together and tackle specific challenges. For example, we set up a SDG data collaborative with UN Statistics Division to work towards better interoperability, and we host international events such as the Data for Development Festival. Finally, all the work that we do 
uh, attempts to reduce the barriers, the technical barriers that there are to have better data, but also the political ones. And for example, uh, I want to talk about uh, the Africa Regional Data Cube. Uh, so we're supporting five countries in East and West Africa to access and use 17 years of satellite data in order uh, to improve their policy making. And we are connecting them with key partners such as NASA and the Group on Earth Observations so they can have analysis ready data through an infrastructure called a data cube. And the data cube it has many applications, it helps us it helps governments understand land degradation, detect illegal mining, and strengthen food security. So about a decade ago, a country such as Kenya would have paid approximately a million dollars per year in order to access this data. However, it is now open and free, but the challenge just does not end with having data. There are many technical uh, issues, uh, there are whole infrastructures that need to be set up in order to collect uh, have the data and analyze it and have the necessary capacities to do so. So by bringing together these five countries through a common infrastructure, we're also helping them to troubleshoot together, to take training together, and as well to learn from each other along the way. And especially having governments uh, at the highest level agree and commit to this infrastructure, we're also putting the right political attention so it has resources and there's collaboration between different agencies and ministries. And we are expanding, expanding this initiative to support countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, and we're doing so with, with the help of Google Cloud and some credits that we're getting through their uh, Data Solution for Change program. And in addition to that, we have partnered uh, for the last year with, with Google Cloud to do a series of SDG-related concepts in which we want to, to get better ideas and, and have attention on how to bring solutions for the SDGs. Thanks, Alonzo. So, one of the SDG-related contests that Alonzo just mentioned is Visualize 2030. Visualize 2030 Data Stories for the SDGs is a data storytelling contest for students where we ask students uh, from around the world to analyze data sets from the World Bank and from the United Nations Statistics Division to visualize that data using Google Data Studio and to ultimately tell a data-driven story about how at least two of the sustainable development goals influence each other and how we can achieve them by 2030. Um, there's an interesting backstory behind this contest as well. Um, so Alonzo mentioned the Data for Development Festival before, and that was uh, in part the inspiration for the Visualize 2030 contest. At that festival, uh, there were a lot of talks and sessions about the importance of democratizing access to data, um, about inviting everyone to the table and making this data accessible and uh, consumable by everyone. And data visualization has a big part to play in that. And that's essentially what led to the ideation around this contest and bringing it to life uh, later that year in 2018. For the applicants, um, the top five eligible submissions were to receive a $10,000 cash prize, an announcement and promotion by Google Cloud. We also were working with the World Bank and also the United Nations Foundation to make this possible. So again, you know, in thinking about what's at the heart of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, there's this idea of cooperation and building bridges. And this is definitely also at the heart of this contest. We also worked with an expert panel of judges in order to select the final five winners, uh, including Rajesh Mirchandani, Chief Communications Officer of the United Nations Foundation, Claire Malamid, who's the CEO of the Global Partnership team, Kaishan Fu, a director at the World Bank, Richard Curtis, who is a writer, director, and co-founder of The Red Nose Day. You also may be familiar with some of his popular films like Love Actually. Uh, Cindy Housen, who at the time was a research VP <coughs> at Gartner. Uh, Fausto Ibarra, director of product management with Google Marketing Platform. And Simon Rogers, data editor at the News Lab at Google. So with this expert panel of judges, we we're really looking to bring together a variety of, of expertise areas together from sustainable development to communications to data storytelling. Um, in order to assess the finalists and determine, again, these, these top five winners.
So these are the five students who submitted the most compelling SDG data stories. <coughs> Actually, with us, we have Evan, Kelsey, and Sarah. Could you please raise your hand? Just a round of applause, please. <laughs> They come from different backgrounds, they're specializing in different topics, and some are doing undergraduate studies and some are graduate students. However, through storytelling and design, they all provided compelling ways in which, uh, and stories uh, to talk about the SDGs. And they're having, their ideas could have real world impact, and we hope they don't stop here. What stood out amongst all of the submissions, the, the winning submissions, is that they also found these relationships between how one goal affects the other, and positive changes in one lead to, to benefits on others, and vice versa. So Anissa is a master's student of interactive journalism at City University of London. She focused on SDG 5 and SDG 6, 16, which are gender equality, peace, justice, and strong institutions, respectively. She explored the relationship between increased female participation and less corruption and stronger institutions. She zoomed in Rwanda's data as an example of positive change. So Anna is a student at UC Berkeley's Master of Information and Data Science program. She focused on SDG 3, SDG 4, SDG 5, and SDG 8 which are good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, decent work, and economic growth, respectively. She explored these dimensions across a variety of visualizations to make the case that gender equality must be embedded in core social structures to have impact, and that as a result, other areas that rely on these same structures will have positive gains. Evan is a commerce student at McMaster University. He focused on SDG 1, No Poverty, and SDG 13, Climate Action. He walked us through the story of how, as middle-income countries begin to catch up with high-income states, the resources, consumption, and CO2 contributions exponentially increase. He used data to back up his recommendations and, provides, and provided useful ways to engage on these issues. So another one of the finalists, uh, Kelsey Wang, developed a data story called The Inequalities of Today and Tomorrow, where she focused on how education can help to address both poverty and climate change, uh, looking at SDGs 1, 4, and 13. She began her data story with a question. Are people doing better or worse than before? How can we compare the past to the present? A very loaded question, of course. But from there, she dug deeper into the expansion of the human population, which as of 2017 is over 7 billion people, and also changes in life expectancy. And looking at those two variables to think about the unintended kind of consequences that come from that. For example, uh, agricultural, industrial agriculture and uh, land scarcity as well. Especially with increases in income inequality, Kelsey made the case that education and internet technologies can actually act as an equalizer across the world and also serve to empower individuals around how they can take action around climate change. At the end of her story, Kelsey concluded that quality education for everyone is a building block for a better, more sustainable, and more equitable future. Sarah Liu, in her data story titled Earth, water, air, and rising temperatures, focused on a total of four SDGs, so not just two, but four. Um, specifically, SDG two on zero hunger, SDG six, clean water and sanitation, SDG 13 around climate action, and SDG 15, life on land. So as you can see pictured here, uh, Sarah developed an interactive <coughs> roadmap to sustainable development. So really analyzing the effects that agriculture has upon the environment from land use to water scarcity. She assessed agricultural greenhouse gas emissions over time, uh, changes in land use, and also livestock waste management. So really looking at these variables holistically. In addition, she presented a case study on Madagascar land use and how nearly 800 mammal species are threatened by agriculture and habitat loss today. 
Another case study explored this data story, or explored in this data story, uh, was that of Ethiopia, where in 2016, over 90% of available fresh water was used for agricultural purposes. Overall, Sarah made the case for sustainable agriculture as key to combating climate change, fostering life on land, providing clean water and sanitation to everyone, and concluded with a call to action for everyone to practice more sustainable habits, including limiting meat consumption and supporting urban farming. So with that, we would like to say, you know, there's an opportunity to learn more about our respective organizations and these initiatives, starting with the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. So we're an organization-based network, so if you're interested in becoming part of us, uh, all the information is available at our website. I would also want to invite you to check out our Twitter account, Data for SDGs, and to subscribe to our newsletter. We really strive to provide a um, interesting information and ways to engage not only with the partnership but also with the whole network. And for more information on Data Solutions for Change, including the nonprofit stories um, and uh, just you know, exciting information around, you know, how, if you're a nonprofit, how you can access this program, how you can apply, you can visit cloud.google.com slash data solutions for change, pictured here, and also to learn more about Visualize 2030. Um, and the winners themselves. And you can also explore their interactive data, stu uh, data stories within the Google Data Studio tool. You can visit cloud.google.com slash visualize2030. And again, just another note to kind of wrap this session before we open to questions, and very much encouraging questions, um, is that what is key across all of these initiatives and what we've discussed today, again, is this, this idea of cooperation, of looking across industries and really looking at what can everyone bring to the table in you know, these initiatives. There are experts across a variety of different areas, um, whether that's you know, biodiversity or food systems or you know, even students working around data visualization and data analysis. And you know, working you know, together and making these opportunities available, we can accomplish um, some pretty exciting things and work towards addressing uh, some of the world's greatest challenges.